This is episode 102 of the Wilderness Locals podcast. On this episode, our guest is John Barklow. John is the big game product manager from Sitka Year, and he is the man behind Knowledge from Storms, the best place on the internet to learn about being in the outdoors, I think. This podcast is brought to you by Kafaru International. Kafaru makes absolutely bomb-proof gear that is second to none. Kafaru.net, folks. There are a few groups in North America that put boots to the ground, like the Wild Sheep Society of BC. Contrary to popular belief, Wild Sheep Society BC isn't just about sheep. The majority of their projects benefit a variety of ungulates and other wildlife. Check them out at www.wildsheepsociety.com. Great folks over there. I'm a Monarch member. You should be too. And as always, go check out our friends over at Just Shooting Arrows. Just Shooting Arrows is BC's premier archery shop. How's it going, John? Good, man. How are you guys? Good. I uh, I phoned Tyler. I'm like, I messaged John, but he didn't get back to me. Tyler's like, Oh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but John said he didn't like anybody from Alberta that was named Lacey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, but uh, no, did you try to get a hold of me? Well, no, I sent you a text like a week ago. I was asking about podcasting or whatever. Oh, you guys got to just, yeah, sorry. You guys got to just keep hammering me. Oh, it's all right. It's all good, John. I, I said to Tyler, I'm like, we'll get him. We'll no. <laughs> keep, keep, keep hammering. Keep hammering. I, I think I, uh, I think I said that to, to Wacy though, like, like you, you, you and Wacy text very similar. Like when I text you, I'll send you something random and then you'll get back to me like four or five days later. Wacy's kind of the same. So <laughs> standard. Well, <laughs> let's just establish one thing. I fucking hate text. Mm -hmm. I hate email because I get so many of them a day. I can't keep up anymore. Oh yeah. And so I just figure my friends and, and people who know me, like they'll, they'll know enough to send back, you know, like, Hey man, did you get my text? Mm. Normally I respond to the second one for sure. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. That just went to the top of the priority list, but I'll get so many, man, if they come in early and I didn't, don't get to them till late, mm -hmm. unfortunately, they just fall to the bottom. And then with text, it just, my God, they just become endless, you know, like at least emails I can delete or flag or move to a, something else. And yeah, yeah, I'm making uses now, but thanks for, it's nothing. Personal. Thanks for, thanks for continuing to reach out guys. <laughs> <laughs> so good. No, it's crazy you now, man. Like between social media and cell phones and everything like you, it's, it's almost impossible to escape the constant onslaught of communication with everyone. Um, and I mean, that might be why, you know, hunting is so great because you can disconnect, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's tough coming back mm -hmm. from from that disconnection, but yeah, it's nice to get away. I Very remember, few places you can do that. Remember all those years though that <clears throat> we just if you wanted to find out what was going on, you had to go home <laughs> to see if anyone had go called, right? You're <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so. That's yeah. But you used to be able to use it as an excuse. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, I, you know, I was gone. And now with in reaches and all that kind of stuff, it's those excuses are gone now, too. Mm hmm. You know? Yeah. No kidding. So what's going on, man? It's been a little while. Uh, You know, kind of in the heart of summer right now. Yeah. And uh, just kind of training and trying to get a couple hunts in place and. Yeah, honestly, I'm kind of my, my, my head's even thinking like past this season to like the next couple, what I want to do. I'm, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I want to get some things off my bucket list. So, um, but yeah, tra training is going okay physically. Every year is a little different. Um, shot, shot training and all that's going great. Sh bow shooting good. And I'm ready. Like I'm jacked up, ready to go. I think five weeks ish until antelope opener. And then, you know, from there we flow into, uh, into elk, which is really 
what I try to, you know, that's like my primary focus every year, Mm -hmm. but, but, uh, no, it's going good. You know, just work, you know, the sick of work is super busy. And then I try to fit in everything else I'm doing around the edges. So, Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's, it's, it's been a pretty good summer, actually, probably the same as you guys. Our summer really didn't start until, I mean, really till the end of June. I mean, we, we were still, I mean, we're getting good rain here still, but at least it's warm now. But, uh, yeah, so I'm thinking everybody's thinking antler growth and stuff's going to be off the chart this year. Um, but I'm also thinking I've seen years like this, maybe not this moist, but where, you know, those animals can be anywhere now. And especially guys that are kind of banking on them heading to like any kind of agriculture or like a certain water source, like that's out the window this year, they could be anywhere. So I think we're going to have to be flexible, but, uh, Mm -hmm. what, what about you guys? You guys are getting ready to go, go out here soon, huh? Sooner than me. I'm thinking. Yeah, you bet. Um, (laughs) so we, we had (laughs) our hunt plan has changed. I don't know what we see three times now. We, um, we had a bunch of regulation change here in BC and we were going, yes, you did. Yeah, we were going on a jet boat trip um, where I would have a sheep tag and Wacy would have a mountain goat and a caribou tag. And uh, nice. so that zone got closed to non-residents. So that, 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 ended way see on that one and then we said okay well then we're gonna hike for caribou in a different unit that they're still open in and then i called to check on the status of wacy's permit earlier this week and they went hey you're good to go on your permit but you can't hunt uh caribou or moose in that zone as a non-resident so me and wacy kind of went back to the drawing board so we're gonna do um an archery mountain goat hunt a hike in archery mountain goat hunt. So it should be super fun. That's awesome. What, when you, when are you going to do that? August? Yeah. August 15th is opener. So yeah, we're going to go for opener and uh, yeah, we should have 10 days or so. And I think it'll be a great time. Is it going to be a different area than when you, where you guys went um, this last winter or no, no. So we, me and Wacy went in August to a very similar spot. Like we could see where we were going this year from where we were last year. Um, okay. And then I went back in February and now we're going to go back in August again. So we're kind of, that's sort of why we're going back to that specific spot um, is now we have some experience in the area and we kind of, we have a, a lot more Intel on getting in and getting out. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, honestly, that's huge. Just one, cause that unknown factor has gone. And two, you can just be more efficient, you know, really move through the terrain a little bit easier than, that you can when you're kind of bumbling your way through the first time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's just it. And like, like the area is super goat dense and, um, me and Wacy were talking, we're like, Oh, we should just find a, a a general open season rifle zone and just go. And I'm like, man, we're both bow hunters. And like, we know the area and like, we kind of have the chips already stacked in our favor in this area. Right. Like let's not wait for something to happen in that zone or for more regulation changes. Let's go do this one. I dig it. Yeah. So that's, yeah. The, that's the plan. Um, I'm super stoked. I think we see this too, eh? Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty amped. I can't wait. I, uh, you know, part of me is like, oh, let's just go bang this. Let's just go bang these goats out with, you know, some rifles and, and just move on. But he's like, well, let's just get, let's get after with the bows. So he's right too. You know, we are both bow hunters. So it'll be fun. It'll be a good trip. And uh, I think, I've repacked, so I've, I went for, I went from having a base camp to spiking out of a base camp. So I was basically going to run a, a medium sized bag. And then I went, and then we went from a, a massive hike in, so I went to super lightweight. Now I've repacked for the third time <laughs> for mountain, for mountain goats. So I'm starting to get, starting to get a little annoyed to repacking my shit here. Yeah. Um, is that just because you guys just keep talking about it and working through it and updating? And yeah, it's just that our plans keep changing to what what the hunt is. Yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah. But I, I think this is it now here. So I'm gonna go with what we got. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, it better be, um, John. You uh, 
I know you've touched on this on knowledge from storms and stuff like that. How, uh, how much do you chase being lightweight? Because me and Wacy are having this back and forth right now. Yeah, it's such an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's really interesting that you just that you ask it right now. Uh, so I think it's totally natural, and you know, I think we all start out way too heavy because we're bringing way too much extra shit, mm-hmm. and then I think we chase weight. Maybe at our own detriment, you know, maybe at our own safety or, you know, we just cut the margin of error so thin that, you know, we end up getting pushed out prematurely. And then I like to say, all right, in the past, I'd say that we would come back to kind of the middle somewhere where we got enough experience that we know what we need and nothing else we don't. And then we probably got a little more money because we're a little older so we can buy, you know, not better stuff, but lightweight costs money, right? So we mm-hmm. can buy lighter weight stuff. That's where I've been for uh, two decades at least, right? Um, chased it down the rabbit hole of going as lightweight as possible. Kind of came back to the middle. Very comfortable with where I am right now. I'm going to, you, you guys are going to be the first ones to hear this, but um, I'm going to admit though that as you get a little older, weight starts to become a little bit more carrying more weight becomes a little bit more of an issue. So I've been looking to where I, you know, where can I continue to cut weight again? Um, not give up capability again, based on experience, but try to cut weight again. But I I think overall, if you just chase weight for the sake of weight, it's really not going to get you anywhere. Um, unless you're, you know, through hiking on one of these big trails or you're, you know, you're alpine climbing and truly trying to set some standard. I, what I see most guys do is they chase weight for the sake of chasing weight. They give up capability. And then at the first sign of a snowstorm or a sniffle, you know, they're leaving the mountains, mm-hmm. which is fine if that's what they want. But most guys, you know, only get two weeks of vacation a year or a week here and a week there. I would rather maximize that. And the one thing about hunting that's totally different than climbing or soldiering or anything else is we go in with a certain weight, but the expectation is the hope that we come out really fucking heavy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, yeah, I got to be able to move around the mountains and I got to be efficient so that I can, you know, kill whatever target animal. But honestly, what's six ounces or eight ounces if I'm planning on carrying out 300 pounds of meat? Um, If you can't manage the extra eight ounces over the course of five days and you think you're going to carry out a caribou, an elk, a full size mountain goat, like maybe you need to reassess what you're doing. Um, So, yeah, I wouldn't chase it just for the sake of chasing it. But I think we have to be cognizant of of what we carry. What I'm looking for is just an overall pack weight. I know with 45 to 55 pounds with the bow, like generally speaking, I can move at a decent, you know, at my pace and just keep moving and moving and moving and moving and moving. Mm -hmm. Um, If I go beyond that 60 ish anymore, like that's tough to, to, to sustain that. And normally if I'm dropping like into the low forties or into the high thirties, I'm, for a week I'm talking about, like, I probably don't have enough stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I'm probably, I just know I'm probably either not bringing enough food or, you know, my shelter is such that if a storm comes in, you know, it may be rough or I may be a little chilly if the temp drops, you know, but I think we just all have to figure that out for ourselves and go, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay being cold. You know, we used to say, uh, I know I'm rambling here, but there, there used to be a saying we used to, having the military and it was travel light, freeze at night. Right. <laughs> so what it was is, Hey, you can only carry so much shit. So like travel light and then just know you're going to have to gut it out. Cause it's not going to be super pleasant. And, uh, and that's okay too. Like that's a decent strategy. If, if, you know, at, at some time in your life, that's a decent strategy or on some trips, I wouldn't have done that for your mountain goat hunt, you mm-hmm. know, that, that winter deal. But no, uh, no. yeah. Yeah. That, the, so my base bag right now with, with a gun. Um, so I didn't count my bow. I'm 39 pounds. That's no food, no water. 
So I think in, if we're going in for 10 or 12 days, I'm probably going to be 50 with, uh, with food and water going up the hill. So, I mean, that's kind of, I don't know if I can even get any better than that. I think that's pretty decent. I don't think most guys can get better than that. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking. Like generally speaking, just, you know, just for planning purposes, pound and a half a day of food, um, water's going to be, you know, I don't know your area. So, you know, you carry three liters of water that weighs something. If you guys got lots of water on the way in, you know, maybe you only go two liters or just bring one Nalgene and just continue to fill it on the way into camp. But yeah, I mean, dude, when you start looking at packs and, you just start looking at all the gear. It's tough to go for a week without, and and you said with with your weapon, right? With my with my gun. So we're bringing both because we're going to be in grizzly country, which I'm not really a fan of. I was yeah. kind of hoping. I was kind of hoping maybe Tyler would just pack the backup and I could just bring my bow. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's he's not a fan of that idea. So I think with a gun. So with a gun, I'm not counting my bow. So I'm 39 pounds or whatever. So. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're probably right where you need to be. And you know, you really don't, I mean, really when you start to look at it, you're like, you know, I need a shelter, I need a stove, I need a little extra, you know, clothing where you're getting that where, you know, we all get the weight is in the food. So, like I said, if, if, if you're at a pound and a half a day, like times seven days, 10 days, like that's a lot of weight. The good thing is hopefully you're eating that weight down every day. So as you continue to get, say, more tired over time, like that weight just comes down. So, you know, I think that's a pretty good place to start. Yeah, I'm at 39, 40 pounds. Maybe I top out at 55 and then I eat my way back down, you know, closer to 40 as the trip goes on. And uh, quite frankly, if, if I if I kill early, depending on what I'm doing, I'm dumping half. I like I'm literally dumping half that food, like freeze dried, dumping it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to dump candy bars or anything in wrappers, but like feed the birds, dump the food, get out of here. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's probably about where you need to be, because if not, you're going to have a pack that probably isn't worth worth a shit to carry anything. You know, and I see guys chasing weight in the wrong places, my opinion. And it's like, you know. There's lots of ways to save weight that doesn't compromise capability, but there's other places where I'm thinking, you know, these super, super lightweight packs, like they're really not intended for hunting. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it probably carries 35 or 39 pounds good now, but can it carry 150 pounds coming out? Like, I don't know. It's one of the things Um, that, that I always think about with like, um, you know, guys always com- kind of complain about the weight of uh, of a kafaru bag, but to me, that's a pickup truck. You know what I mean? It's it's not a it's not a Ferrari. It's a the the, the kafaru is like to me imp- as important as your weapon because that's that's how you get everything off the mountain. I'd say that in boots. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good one. Yeah. You know that 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 in boots, and I've I've tried a, a bunch of boots in the last couple of years, and you know this one La Sportiva boot called the Equilibrium. It's like, um, I'm, tr- I'm just trying to go from grams to ounces or ounces to grams, but it's like a thousand grams for the pair. Yeah. And listen, I'm a huge fan of the crispy brick stalls, but they're a thousand grams basically per boot. Right. So you're yeah, like, yeah. well, what does that, what does that matter? Well, it's two pounds just on your feet that you're shaving off. Mm-hmm. So th- something like that is huge. Right. But where I think guys, you know, from what I've seen where guys waste a lot of weight and and really bulk in the pack is in their sleeping system Mm because they're like, they bring all these clothes, which is fine. You know, I think you need eight pieces, but they they bring, you know, a a clothes. Okay. They bring extra base layers. I see no reason to bring extra anything. I have one of every piece of clothing I need. There's no reason to bring extra, you know, assuming you have a quality system. And then they're like, well, it's going to be 20 degrees out at night. So I'm going to bring a 20 degree sleeping bag or a 10 degree sleeping bag. And it's like, I don't really see the need for that because I'm never taking my clothes off. I'm going to sleep in those clothes to help me with insulation. And then I'm going to bring a really lightweight bag. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing together is going to help me. And, you know, a ground pad's important. 
But then guys are like, well, I'm, I'm going to be in a double wall tent. And I'm like, okay, well, a double wall tent on average, let's just say it's, I mean, five to seven to 10 degrees warmer inside the tent than outside. So if you think it's going to be 20, it's probably going to be 25 or 30 degrees inside the tent. So now do you really need a 10 degree sleeping bag? And I, I just think guys can, can figure weight savings out in places like that. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is fuel consumption. If, if you don't know your fuel consumption, depending on the stove you're bringing, I'm guessing you guys are bringing canister stoves, mm-hmm. um, you will carry way too much weight and fuel that you don't need. But if you go super, chase super light, you may run out of fuel and then all that dehydrated food is basically worthless, right? I mean, you could certainly put cold water in it, I guess. But mm-hmm. um, so I think, I think sleep system and I think stove gas is like the two places guys can, can figure out weight um, hmm. just to start. So I went through stoves last night, John, because I was the jet boil guy for the last freaking 12 years, you know? old school jet boil, and I weighed it out and it was super heavy as a package, right? Um, so I went to the Soto burner and just a little pot and uh-huh. a small can to a small canister and I'm one pound. I think I'm right around one pound even with that setup. And so I was trying to do the math on, you know, one, one little canister on how many boils you can get and stuff. And I just, I think it's just something I'm not willing to really risk. You know, I'll bring two a, a spare canister. I think just for that, because if you're spending, if we're spending twelve days and we're you're running your stove, you know, at least twice a day, I think it's it eats a lot of fuel, especially at elevation, right? Yeah. So this is where this is a great topic, I think. But th- this is where um, two things: one, you have to be really familiar with with how you uh, use your stove. So you said, you know, Hey, I'm going to use it twice a day. All right. Perfect. I use mine twice a day too. I use it in the morning. I boil 16 ounces of water. So half a liter, I boil half a liter of water for coffee. Boom. So that's a pretty quick boil. And then I boil, unless it's winter, I boil another 16 ounces at night for my dehydrated food food. So that's one liter of water I'm boiling, but I'm dividing it over time. So the, I know that about myself, however you do it, you have to figure that out. But then what I do is, so let's say, take that stove system you have and, you know, try to go out on a day that's, if you can mimic the environmental conditions you're going to be in. Like, so if you think it's going to be a certain temp go, yeah, I'm going to go out in the morning when it's coolest. I'm going to set my uh, stove up. I'm going to put my, my burner pot on it. I'm going to protect it with rocks and I'm literally going to, uh, time how quickly it takes to boil one liter of water. So boom, it takes three minutes. All right, perfect. Now I I know how long it takes to boil one liter of water. And now I'm just going to keep that stove running and see how long that stove is going to run. So if that stove runs, for 30 minutes before the gas goes out and it takes three minutes to boil a liter of water, I know I can get 10 liters of water from that stove. And then I go, well, I'm only out there for seven days. I only boil a liter of water a day. I only need one four ounce canister or I'm out there 12 days. I need two four ounce canisters. So that's the way I do it. And I've gotten away with a four ounce canister on dull sheep hunts in Alaska for a week, seven days, seven and a half, pushing eight days on one four ounce canister because I knew, I knew my fuel consumption. Um, but if you don't, you know, then, then you end up potentially carrying too much or, uh, what's worse is probably carrying too little. Right. So anyways, that's, that's a way to figure out fuel consumption. Yeah. I'm definitely going to do that. I, you know, I kind of know I'm like three and a half minutes to boil. So, I can, I think I'm going to do that. Just see what, how, what the runtime is on it. Cause this is a new, this is a new burner that I got this, this Soto, uh, uh, Soto, I can't remember what the name of it is, but so I'll have to, I'll have to do some little work on it here to see what I'm going to get for runtime on it. What are you using for a cook pot? It doesn't come with one, right? You're putting like a, a little cup on there or something like that. Little yeah. Pan. So I bought this, uh, I think this burner is called the Amic. 
Amicus. So I bought a soda, this Soto Amicus, and it came and and then I bought there. They call it the River Pot. So with the burner in the pot, it's eight ounces. So oh, yeah, wow. they came yeah. together. So it, yeah, so it's a pretty nice little setup. But it's yeah, I don't know the runtime on this for just yet. And I think it's going to be more consumption than the, the jet boil is. Just jet boils are always a little more efficient. I think. Yeah, but you know what? Nobody, you're never going to know until you go out and try it. And uh, yeah. I, I just think that's what we all got to do. But mm-hmm. that that'll give you that'll at least give you some assurance that you're not, that you're making the right decision. Um. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, it's an easy way to do it. Cool. That's wicked. You ever? Uh, <laughs> you probably have some good stories of uh, you know going in too late and suffering, eh? Oh, dude, I've, yeah, I, I have never admitted I'm the smartest guy I know. Right. Um, no, for sure. You, you know, you're what the, the worst ones are when, uh, so most of the time, right. I like to say you can get away with something until you, until the day you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and every time you do, you kind of get a little more confidence that what you're doing is the right thing. But Mother Nature always has a really good way of smacking us all in the face. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's every time it's been when the weather was unexpected, right? So a storm came in of some proportion and, you know, it either came in too quick and we couldn't get out or, uh, you know, it came in and you know, you just were not prepared for it. And, um, you know, I got trapped up on Mount Rainier one time with a buddy. Uh, I've, I've told this story. Maybe I've told this story somewhere before, but you know, but we were trying to go in super light. We were trying to train for some big mountains in Alaska. So we were going to go climb this one route on Mount Rainier. It didn't work. Weather pushed us out and we were planning on going for three days on the mountain. So we got pushed out. We're back in my van. We're, we're hanging out riding out the storm for three days, just hanging out. And every day that went by and we got more like uh, antsy to go, we kept getting braver and we're like, mm-hmm. Oh, we don't need that. And then we kept getting more brave. Oh, we don't need that. And we're like, we're just going to go climb the mountain in 24 hours. So it went from three days to 24 hours, one 24 hour push, like nonstop. We were going to stop halfway brew up. So, you know, melt some snow, drink some water, eat a meal, we were going to brew up on the way up and on the way down, but we were not planning on spending a night there and sure as shit. We get halfway up right where we are. We're going to be. We start brewing up a giant storm rolls in a giant three day winter hurricane rolls in on the mountain. We had this experimental tent that literally did not keep wind out. There was more snow inside our tent than I think outside our tent. It was so windy inside the tent, it was blowing the stove out. Oof. And of course, you can't melt snow. We can't hydrate. We can't hydrate. We're living at, I don't know what the altitude was at the time. Let's just call it 11,000 feet. Um, we're like, well, f- fuck, what are we going to do? We can't eat the dehydrated food. We can't hydrate ourselves, which was more important. We're going to freeze to death up here. Um, you can't go down because we're on a glacier, so you can't move and it's a complete whiteout. And sure enough, just by the, just by luck, this other group was behind us. We didn't know about, and they set up my buddies out shoveling out our tent so it doesn't collapse. And he says, you're not going to believe this, but there's a party of climbers next to us in a big North face V 25. I'm going to go ask them if we can climb into their vestibule and cook. And so for three days, they let us go into their vestibule and run our stove so we could melt water. Um, and then, you know, the storm cleared, we ran to the top, got, got off the mountain, you know, learned some lessons. Um, you know, but it's always, it's always those times I was out in a, another like experimental tent, like bivy sack kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just take people's word for it that it's, you know, the thing's good to go. And I'm like, ah, it's structurally sound. It's super easy to set up. I'm like, ah, this will be fine. And go out of, uh, I think three or four days in Alaska for work, you know, and set the thing up, climb inside, starts to rain, starts to rain heavy. And 
on a bivy sack, you know, the range is going to puddle up on top of the bivy sack. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it started puddling up, I realized very quickly that this new quote experimental tent leaked like a colander. And I was literally soaked, bro, from the waist down (sighs) 15 minutes into the storm. And I, I stayed that way for the next four days. And I'm like, oh, this just sucks. You it's know, just the worst. it's just the worst. And so really the, the, the two things are untested gear is, is one of them. So both of those were shelters mm-hmm. and then, um, and then weather that you didn't expect rolling in that just took you by surprise. And you're like, yeah, this is just going to be a suffer fest. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you're, if you're on that hunt of a lifetime or you're, you know, you're only two weeks of vacation, it's like, what do you do? You know, like I, I was doing it enough back then. I was like, oh, I'll come back, you know, but, or I, I'm smart enough to be able to figure this out. But if not, it's like, do you leave? Do you leave and burn your whole vacation? Cause when that storm clears, if you're hunting, like oftentimes the hunting's really good right after that storm. Right. Yeah. So it's like, you want to be in there and ride that storm out, but is it going to push you out? And then, you know, you got to spend a day drying your shit. So I think, yeah, we have to figure all those things out. But, uh, you know, and oftentimes I've learned more from my failures than I have from, from mm-hmm. my successes. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that's, um, I think that's the way to learn is to, to screw stuff up. Right. It's a be- I think it's one of the best ways to learn. Yeah. That, yeah, uh, absolutely. yeah, that, um, the, 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 the um, shelter thing is an interesting topic too, eh? Where we've kind of been going back and forth a little bit. Like when we were doing the super, super deep on foot um, caribou hunt planning, we're like, <laughs> should we run a two? Should we each run a two P tent, or should we get like a an ultralight three P or four P tent and split the weight in half? And it's like it's kind of been an ongoing debate, eh, Wacy? Yeah, we're back and forth with it, and it's just. I'm just the guy, I'm just the type of guy, uh, unless I'm a big dude, Barco, right? Um, uh, huh. and I like to put my fucking bag in the tent, especially if it's pouring rain. So if I said to Tyler, I'm like, I'll share a tent with you. If we can do a four P like there's room for me and my shit. If we can, if you're, if the weight can be under what I can carry as a two P cause I pretty much fill up a two person tent. Like I'm a Sasquatch. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I got a, so this is the debate the debate we're having i'm okay with splitting the shelter but at the end of the day man i just don't want to be i can't share a 2p or a 3p with another man it's just not going to work <laughs> i i don't so. think you'll find a four person tent though that'll i mean most of them are pretty heavy mm-hmm. you're probably better off at that point if that's you know if that's like where you guys are you're probably better off carrying two smaller you know in your case maybe a two person shelter and, and, you know, maybe you could get away with the TP or something like that. But some of these TPs, man, are, I mean, I just, I just got one from hyper light mountain gear and it's, you know, it's pretty nice and it's, it's a really durable TP and it's got some ventilation in the top that I like, but I just think not you guys, but I just caution people. It's like, Hey, if you're going to wear run a TP, like, understand how to use it, understand its limitations, understand how to stake it down. Right. And then, and I don't know, but my guess would be if you guys are going caribou hunting and you go on a teepee, aren't you going to get tore up by mosquitoes? Yeah. That's, that's sort of what we had been talking about. We were looking at like, um, what's that brand we see z packs we were looking at that z packs cuban fiber 4p it's like a bathtub bottom on it um but uh yeah on the on the goat hunt i think we're just gonna run two separate tents and i think wacy's gonna run a hubba hubba and then i think i'm gonna run either a hubba hubba or a hilly yeah so the other thing you have to consider on a goat hunt with a with a shelter is the footprint. So the size, Mm -hmm. like, will you be able to always pitch a four P tent or are you going to be better off pitching a one and a half man or small two man tent and scatter them across a mountainscape? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't know the terrain you're going in, but you know, oftentimes it's like, man, we're not going to be able to find a flat spot 
for a four person tent. It's just too goddamn big. Yeah. But we can probably always find a place, even if it's, even if the tent doesn't fit, like I can pitch a tent over top of a, just say a caribou bed or a mountain goat bed maybe and sleep in the bed, so to speak. And yeah, the sides of the tent are, are not going to be, you know, super level. So I think you have to figure that out too. It's like, are you going to be able to fit a shelter, whatever size in the environment you're going into? Um, yeah. That's why like, sometimes I'll just run, even though they're not my favorite, like I'll just run a, a bivy sack because, you know, or even a bivy sack and a tarp, because I know on the footprint on the ground, if I just find a bed to lay in, that's my size, like I'm good. And then I can pitch a tarp over top. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, there's, there's lots that go, that go into it. I, I'm not familiar with that four P tent you talked about. I'd be, I'd be interested to check that out, especially one made of Cuban fiber. Like that's pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. It's, it's super light. I mean, I don't have any experience with it. I, I just, we've kind of been talking back and forth and like, we're able, if we went that route, we'd be able to cut weight down, but we're, we're not doing the caribou thing anyway. So like the, the single person tent thing is all good. What's your, um. What's your favorite tent, John? Uh, right now, I've been running the Hilleberg Solo for a long time. Nice. <laughs> I, I really like it. So c- a couple reasons. One, you know, anything Hilleberg just seems to be bomb proof. So I, I know if I get stuck in a, you know, in a freak storm that I'm okay, it's going to hold up. Um, I've cut, quite frankly, I've cut a bunch of stuff off to, to lighten the load. It's not the lightest tent. None of, none of their tents are the lightest tent. Mm -hmm. So I've cut a bunch of shit off, um, to, to lighten it up. And then what I like about it is it's just big enough for me in the, in the actual tent, but then it's got a little vestibule. So if the weather's bad, I can, you know, bring my weapon inside, put my boots in the vestibule, Mm -hmm. put my cook stove in the vestibule, gives me a little room. But if, you know, we don't have our, our issue down here isn't really bugs. Mm -hmm. So if I don't need bugs, um, I can actually leave the tent behind and just bring the fly with the poles Mm -hmm. and just climb inside that. And then I have a shelter that's much more bomb proof to weather than a traditional TP with a center pole. Um, but I still have the entire footprint of the tent inside. So the tent basically hangs inside the, uh, the rain fly when it's pitched. Mm -hmm. So you can choose to run the tent or not. Um, and, and then you're, and then you're looking at something that's, you know, got quite a bit of capability in the weather, pretty damn lightweight. Um, you know, but still has a, a a fairly small footprint. So, you know, I run those, I'll run a bivy, uh, you know, a bivy and a ground pad, which, you know, I tell people not to do, but I just think they, <laughs> it's not the most interesting and luxurious life living in a bivy sack, but mm-hmm. yeah, those are the two things. And like I said, I'm trying this hyperlight mountain gear, uh, TP, you know, pyramid tent, TP tent. And then what they've got, interestingly enough is, and I think some, another brand has this too, but they've got like this, essentially like a, like a little interior room that you can clip in that's just mesh oh yeah yeah. if you are if you are if you are in buggy terrain so i'm i'm gonna play around with that this year too and i think that whole thing i mean it's definitely lighter than my hilleberg um again i don't think the capability is going to be the same as far as like big weather but you know for certain trips i think it could be great like i'd have brought that on the caribou hunt last last year two years ago whenever i went to alaska last i'd have brought that but there's no way I was bringing a TP tent without, you know, a way to get out of the bugs. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I just knew that was going to be a, a, you know, a real issue. Yeah. So I've, I've ran uh, a TP now. This would be like four or five years since I started using TVs. And uh, one of the things that, like I brought on that goat hunt last year, I brought a TP up, my TP up. And the problem is just what you said. What we kind of ran into was the footprint was so large that we ended up having a hard, we had a hard time finding level places. And, and not only that, like once you stake it out and you get everything tight, there's still the guy lines that you got, you should tie off on, on the, on the sides. Cause the big wind picks up, their teepees are kind of susceptible to that. So 
I, I quickly realized like we were guying out to some rocks that we piled up and this and that. But at the end of the day, I was like, man, if we get caught in the high winds here, we're totally fucked. And so that was a good eye opener for me on that last goat hunt. I was like, okay, hey, maybe TP isn't it for this. But, like it does have its place. And I have used it on elk hunts with the wood stove and it is nice. But I just think sometimes maybe it's just not, that's just not it, you know? Yeah. I, I, I just, I caution people because, you know, certain hunter, hunting celebrities promote this or that and it works for them because they've got all this experience and like you, you've learned, but you know, if you're, if you're somebody new and you're going into the mountains for the first time and you're like, oh, well, you know, every cool guy I know runs a TP tent, like you, you may not, you may not be super stoked, you mm-hmm. know, because you might not be able to anchor it right, or you might not be able to find the right size, or, you know, you might not guy it out on the, on the secondary points and then it gets knocked down in the wind. So I just think, you know, people have to kind of, they have to dig in a little bit more and not just take at face value what people say. They got to understand the why of why the person's using it. And, you know, I think w- what we're talking about is you need more than one shelter. I mean, we've got lots of different shelters we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. A lot of times I'll default to a teepee is like the cook tent, right? So if, if I'm going to, you know, if I'm in bear country, I don't want to cook anywhere near my camp. If I got a super lightweight, you know, nine ounce, 12 ounce tarp or teepee tent, like I'm pitching that 200 yards away from camp. That's where I'm cooking in inclement weather. And then I'll go sleep in the tent, you know, 200 yards away. So you know, it, it depends on the environment you're in. You know, if you're down in Colorado, that's not really an issue. Um, they'll tell you yeah. black bears, but that's not an issue. Hmm. Uh, but up here in Montana, like you're, you're just, you're going to, you're going to get killed if you don't. Did you see that uh, hunt that Corey Jacobson did? I think it was last year in Alaska for elk. And he oh yeah, on... I did a whole podcast with him on it. Yeah. So, so, so that's a good example. So Corey brought the TP with the stove and they're like, oh, we'll dry out. But Corey soon realized that there ain't enough fucking dry wood in that, on that whole island to dry anything. So the teepee was almost useless to them. They might as well have just stayed with their original tent, you know? Yeah, that's what he said. They they never got that wood stove running in a week. Oof. Great they, film. They never could get the wood. Oh, it was great film. But they never could great. get the wood ignited. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome film. I I really, I don't really like watching too much hunting anymore. I've got my bill on it, but that was a great one to watch. I can't even remember what it was called. (laughs) It was called Alaska Elk. And I'll be honest, I don't watch hardly anything hunting related anymore. Um, I watched that. I took notes and then we did a podcast about it and uh, just talked about like all the lessons learned. And because there's so many lessons about I mean, so many things, right? I mean, the survival aspect and how they almost got hypothermic the first night when they were, you know, unplanned bivy out with the dead elk and then the weather rolled in and then Donnie got sick and then they couldn't navigate because of the fog. And I mean, there's just so many things. And then the TP tent that he couldn't run the stove. And yeah, it was a great, great film. I've never heard. And just by looking at the terrain, I've never heard of this. It was so wet and so steep. They were wearing fucking crampons when they were packing that elk out to get down that wet terrain. And that's the first I've ever heard of anybody really wearing crampons outside of snow and ice. And I'm like, man, that makes so much sense. Cause them guys would have just been tobogganing down them hills with them full loaded packs, you know? Yeah, dude, I, I didn't go out on Kodiak without crampons. Now I didn't wear them every single time, but when I had a buddy on a mountain goat hunt in like August, tomahawk 600 uh feet down a mountain because he slipped on wet grass Mm -hmm. i was like oh yeah no especially when you have weight on your back it's like nope crampons wet grass works just awesome um yeah man we talked about that and i was like you could not have met uh walked around and navigated could you and he's like no no we wouldn't have been able to go anywhere i learned that's just yeah one of the things I, I don't want to harp on his film too much here, but one of the things I found really interesting about it was the decision they made on that sunny day when they arrowed that bull and they hiked out with basically no gear. 
Like, I don't think he even had a jacket. He was wearing a vest. They nope, killed that no puffy bull. jacket, no rain gear, Oof. no tarp. Yep. And they got fucked because the, that weather rolled in, and there they were with a dead bull, freaking five miles or however far they were from their tents, and they were screwed. Seven. Right? Seven miles. Seven. Yeah, no, we talked we talked about that. And um, I think there's I think people can watch that and learn a lot from it. Um, but, you know, it's it's a very similar environment to where you guys live. Right. Mm. Um, I mean, Montana is it's Montana for the most part is pretty permissive. But those northern provinces and, and Alaska, it's like it's uncompromising. And you can't just like where I'm living here, a guy who's grown up here his whole life, like you can't live here in the lower 48 and expect to take the same gear and use the same tactics up north Mm -hmm. that you do down here. It's just not going to work. And so, um, yeah, they were they were really lucky in in some regard. But there's there's a lot, a lot to learn from from watching that film. If you if you look at it from that perspective and not just like the entertainment aspect. Mm -hmm. I uh, I was gonna say when you guys were talking about crampons on my grass, a few, a few years ago I was on a, a mule deer hunt with uh, kind of my hunting mentor Ronnie. And we were coming out with a mule deer, and uh, you know we just split it. And we we're cruising down these like kind of you know middle of BC grasslands hills, and they were a bit dewy. And Wacy's like super sure footed like 30 year veteran sheep hunter. Right. And he's just cruising down these things. So I'm, I'm trying to follow him and keep up. And I did the same thing. I, I rode my bag all the way down to the bottom of a gully. And we see, I've quite uh, like, like I zipped past Ronnie, like this is my dude all the way to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> he gets to the bottom. He's like, that was fast. I'm just like soaked and covered in crap. And ugh. dude, it's, it's easy to happen, but, and you can get seriously messed up. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I like at very least I keep those, um, you know, like boot chains, like the the kind of rubber neoprene ones that you can just pull over your boots in my bag these days. Like unless I know I won't need them. But if there's kind yeah. of an unknown factor, I, I end up bringing them these days. Yeah, I ended up doing a video just on crampons. And I, I'm not sure people like even realize why I did it. but. I was just like, yeah, I did a whole video on the different types of crampons and, and kind of maybe scenarios you'd wear them in. Yeah. Oh, cool. um, but it's, it's not something that's like, again, down here, you probably don't need them very often. Right. Mm-hmm. But where you guys are living or up in Alaska, it's like, it, it should at least be a part of your planning to go, Hey, do I need these or not? Mm-hmm. And, um, cause Man, it's just so sketchy. I mean, you might as well be on ice. Oh yeah. If uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it can be it can be rough. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so here's here's a, a topic that um interests me specifically with you, John, but also with you, AC. I kind of know your answer, AC. But like a guy a guy like you, John, that like you've been doing this for a long time and you've been doing it at a um uh, out of um, what's the word like a high frequency especially the gear stuff like the gear testing and everything you do for Sitka and and now knowledge from storms like how does a guy stay motivated because we were just talking about like be, being tapped out on hunting films and like um I've kind of taken this year as a little bit of a um sabbatical from just like bringing in everything hunting all the time like like it's it's not even in my youtube suggested anymore you know what i mean and 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 not that i'm not super passionate about hunting and it's like all i think about but like i've been like making a point of purposely focusing on some other stuff so that the fire doesn't go out you know what i mean so i guess yeah i guess my question is how does a guy stay like like you're you're like you're just ripping on, on knowledge from storms and Sitka and then your own stuff. Like how does a guy keep it on for so long? Uh, well, it, it, it's kind of all I think about yeah, and it's all I thought about for a really long time professionally, you know, as well as just personally. So it, it just, I don't want to say it kind of becomes part of me, but it's just, it's just what I've, what I've done when I got back into 
when I got back kind of into this and started the knowledge from storms deal, it was because I did miss talking about it. Cause I thought maybe I had something to say that somebody would find some, some interest in or, or help somebody out. <clears throat> um, so the gear and all that, like I've, I've never not been that person. The actual, this is going to sound bad. Cause <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I am at some level in the hunting industry um, for the most part, except for like that Alaska elk film we were talking about. I do not, I do not watch any hunting related media anymore. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of like porn. Like I can tell you how it starts and how it ends. And it's just, <laughs> it's just not that good. Um, the rare occasion that something is good, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, it gets your attention. Um, you know, we did that, uh, Sika did that film years ago in 2017 when we, we launched a new, a new pattern, a uh, new camel pattern. We, we did that linguist film mm-hmm. and it was like, you know, trying to be like pull on the tradition and everything. And I thought we did a good job. I thought that film came out good. And then there's that Alaska elk film that just came out and then everything in between, there's just a lot of shit. Yeah. And I, th- I, I just, I, you know what? I know too much to know that half the time these, not all the time, but half the time these films are like cobbled together and there's a bunch of bullshit B-roll and they lie about what the true story was. And I, I just don't need that in my life. Mm-hmm. So I just focus on what I'm good at, which I think is the gear side. And if, you know, if you're somebody who makes films and, and wants to do that, then that's your jam, but that's, that's not mine. And so I just don't partake in it. Um, at all, or, or it probably would just turn me off. So that's how I approach it. <laughs> yeah, I think I that's, think. Go ahead, wait, sir. That's what that. So like, fifteen twenty years ago, Barco, I filmed everything for whatever reason. As a young guy, I thought maybe I was sure just hunting sure star or something. So I got I filmed I filmed I filmed archery moose hunts and archery hunts and all this stuff solo solo filmed. And at the end of the day, the camera was starting to cost me stuff. Uh, I, I, it was starting to be like trying to get the camera on instead of trying to get the shot off. So I was like, well, th- this is dumb. And I kind of, that was years and years ago. And I just gave up never to, I never wanted to touch it again. Even Tyler said a few years ago, he's like, should we bring a camera? I'm like, not interested, not interested in bringing yeah. a camera. And, and then nowadays too, it's, it's, it's like everybody wants to critique and, and criticize everything you do. And I just don't need it. And I just, for me, I just, man, I just want to be out hunting. And let let the chips fall where they may, you know. Mm-hmm. But, well, it can definitely have an impact, like you said, on on your hunt. So I've never filmed anything personally. I've been filmed. Basically, it's been used as B roll, right? Mm-hmm. And I've had some really good camera guys, and it's not like I've done a lot of it, but it's always here's been the conversation. I'm going to do what I do. You would do what you do. I'm not fucking waiting on you. <laughs> so, you, you missed the shot. Tough shit. Yeah. Right. Kind of deal. I'm not redrawing, um, but my it's, bow. but it's, yeah, but it's never been for, yeah, I've never had to do that, but it's never been for a TV show. Right. And yeah. so for, for like me personally, I'm, I'm horrible. I, I, I should do more of this and I, I, I wished I had, but, um, you know, I half the time I don't even bring a, a camera or take a picture of myself doing something, mm-hmm. which I probably should do more of, but like, I've got like two pictures from the Alaska caribou hunt. I was like, God damn it. I wish I'd have taken some more. Um, but yeah, it, but I don't want, that's not why I'm out there. I'm out there to do other things and not try to like photo bomb myself. Um, and so I think there's probably a, a happy medium there, but, yeah. uh, I, yeah, I think people that are out there film, I've been with guys. Okay been around guys, been with guys, been on hunts with guys who have cameramen and are filming to do, you know, videos of some sort for TV or whatever. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for those guys. It does not look enjoyable at all for the camera guy or the hunter. It just does not look enjoyable at all. And then if it doesn't go exactly kind of as they had it scripted, then the whole thing's just a disaster. And I'm like, and that's not cool. Like, that's not just something I want to participate in. You know, it's not why I'm out there doing it. So yeah, I've had some good pictures over the years, but very little video. 
And and I just don't see that changing anytime soon for me. For the record, when I said to Wacy, should we bring a camera? I meant for like our own personal, like looking back on it type of deal, you know? Well, uh, that's where these cell phones are so good now. Yeah, that yeah. You almost don't need a second camera. I also like, I, I don't think I would want anybody to be a fly on a wall, like on our goat hunt last year. Like, like I talked about it lots on the podcast, like, you know, there was some situations in that goat hunt where I, I don't think they'd be embarrassing, but it's like, I don't need people watching me suffer up the side of a mountain to, to get, get to where we're going. And then I don't need people watching me having a conversation with Wacy. Like, man, that's pretty fucking steep. Like, like, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, like for us to have made a film out of that, that was like something that would be inspiring to people uh, would have been complete bullshit. Like it would have been, you know, a 10 minute film of Tyler going, that's too steep. No, I don't want to do that. No, let's go this way. Let's take this route, whatever. It's like, uh, it's not very inspirational, but uh, from my perspective, I had a killer time and learn lots. And, you know, it's one of those things. I don't know. I just like, I was saying to Wacy the other day, man, the further we get into the, hunting industry in air quotes the the less i like people inside of it you know what i mean like uh, I, not to be rude or anything but like there, there's we've met some absolute terrific people like you know you and snyder and all these other guys that could not be more genuine but then you meet some of these people and you're like what are you doing like this is just weird yeah I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, no, let's not <laughs> let's not get too far down that with this recording. But anyways, it's just like I, I don't get it. Anyway, so back to my original thing. It's like, um, yeah, like the 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 hunting film thing and all this other stuff. I've kind of I've kind of just been focusing on um, planning our hunts and getting ready for our hunts and kind of you know keeping it keeping it. Uh, internal a lot you know and it's really helped me be super motivated and and like i I, i'm not comparing what we're doing to anyone else now either you know it's sweet no i think i i I don't think we should i mean everybody's got their own their own jam right and so it's like we we shouldn't we shouldn't be comparing ourselves with with anybody else and uh we should be doing it for ourselves and you know, I, I, I try to focus on that because sometimes, you know, it's not the easiest thing and you can get distracted with social media and it's like, nope, nope. I'm just going to keep going out and doing my deal. Yep. Uh, you know, with my buddies and, um, and the way I want, and if you want to do it a different way, that's totally cool. No issue. If you got questions, I'm here to help, but you know, um, this is all kind of our own journey to walk. Yeah. I think I find it's just, it's, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty like, intimate personal thing too like the stuff we do right and like uh, Wacy kind of laughs at me i i'm like uncomfortable posting my face and my own animals you know what i mean <laughs> yeah so. well that's why i mean i joke but I'm, I'm you know in some regard i'm serious i'm like that's why i consider it like porn yeah because it's like you, you know you, you kind of want to watch you know you shouldn't and it's going to be really personal no matter what mm-hmm. and it's like yeah i just don't know if it's the best medium sometimes to portray the the lifestyle and what we do out there Mm -hmm. um it's it's just tough because it is it's it's raw emotion and and you can't script it and not everything's going to go right and uh and sometimes it's ugly right and Mm -hmm. nobody wants to talk about that but that's just the truth and um and so maybe sometimes it's just not worth it's just not worth sharing you know it's just say it's too personal keep it to yourself yeah you guys don't want to see me on on youtube just man it's day six i am fucking chafed (laughs) 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 you know actually that's a good topic dealing with with freaking chafing like i'm a sweaty guy What, what what do i do you ever tried that uh you ever tried that monkey butt powder no but i am gonna write it down it's called monkey butt. Monkey butt. And uh, it, anyways, because I got I got thighs like a cricket, right? So they rub together. Yeah, same. Um, yeah, so you know, I bring uh, I don't bring toilet paper. I bring baby wipes. Same. So little little baby wipe, 
little baby wipe bath and a little monkey butt powder, you know, and you don't have to carry the whole bottle. You can carry some just in a little bag. Uh, dude, that, that goes so far. It really? Is. So far. I'm looking at it oh, on yeah. Amazon right now. Oh yeah. So I was, I was hoping it was still around. Oh yeah. Or I carried, done. I've always carried this little tiny thing of Vaseline. It's small. Like you couldn't even, mm -hmm. you can, she's just basically a break, break this, seal in case of emergency so i have thankfully like it's been a long time since i've been chafed really bad but it sucks when it happens because you can hardly walk right so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh it, it, it i mean it almost becomes as miserable as a blister really <sighs> you know or worse like freaking or, ju your junk's on fire that's not fun yeah no <laughs> it's not normally that's not fun no um, <laughs> no, it's all those little things, you know, I mean, uh, hygiene is something that quite frankly, nobody, I don't, I don't, I haven't, maybe I should, I don't know if you guys have, but like nobody ever talks about hygiene out there. So mm -hmm. I've been thinking about it a little bit just because I've been thinking about, you know, water purification and, and just what that looks like and, you know, how not to get sick out there, which obviously treating your water is one of the best ways to not get sick. Yeah. We see, but, but you know, it's like, I see guys, you know, I see guys, uh, you know, not to be crude, but you know, I see guys wipe their ass with say leaves or toilet paper and then have no way to clean their hands. And then the next thing you know, they're shoving a candy bar in their mouth. And like, I've literally seen guys make themselves sick because of that. Right. Or they're not cleaning their spoon off after seven days or Ugh. they cook their dehydrated food in the cook pot, not in a bag. And then that starts to go bad, you know, when it's 90 degrees outside and you're out there for a week and you're not cleaning the pot out. Um, you know, and so hygiene, like chafing and blisters, like all that I, I call hygiene. And, um, you know, you get a cut for whatever reason and, you know, you don't you don't put something on it from your first aid kit. Like you have to be more diligent out there as far as hygiene than, you know, than you do at the house. Like you can get away with, not that I recommend it, but you can get away with not taking a shower for seven days at the house, not doing much. And you're fine. If you don't do something and I'm not promoting taking a shower by any means outside, but if you don't do something to try to clean yourself up a little bit, mm -hmm. Like it, it can be a really bad experience, dude. I had, I don't know. We called it like jock rod or crotch rod or mm -hmm. something like that. Like, so now I'm going really, now I'm going to be personal. Right. Yeah. But like, dude, I had it so bad for two years when I got out of training and went, I, I got out of training in the Navy dive training and I went to the Philippines. It was so bad that I got sick and it got infected it took two years to get rid of, and I had to go on medication to Oof. get rid of it. You want to talk about miserable? All because it's something small started. I didn't manage it properly. Then I kind of blew it off, as most guys do. And the next thing you know, I was like, it was I was suffering. Mm -hmm. And uh, so ever since then, I'm like, yeah, hygiene in the field is something that in the military, it's talked about all the time. But it's never talked about in the backcountry hunting community. Mm -hmm. And maybe it should be. Maybe I should write a note down to maybe talk about my crotch rot mm -hmm. fucking publicly on a IG video. <laughs> sure, <laughs> it, it, sure. If you want to mitigate I don't have I don't have any pictures. I don't have any pictures, but uh, I could describe it. <laughs> if you if, if you really want to mitigate embarrassment, you can be like, Ty from Wilderness Locals, man, he gets monkey butt like you wouldn't believe. He can hardly walk. This guy's fucking disgusting. <laughs> that's fine that's fine by me i don't mind dude dude you get you get some you get some monkey butt going on man it is it just becomes miserable especially when you're sitting behind glass and you don't have a whole lot to occupy your mind mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're just like oh my god like i gotta deal with this for the next four days oh man you know what's funny is like so i grew up um uh, like camping and dirt biking and stuff with my old man and every day i'd get up and he'd be like marine douche Every single day. There you go. He'd be like, Marine there douche, you like just get a damp cloth or whatever, clean yourself up. So you're not walking around freaking stinking like a 13 year old boy. Right. That was his whole yeah. thing. And you know, uh, it's tough when you're in the back country, but I think like a baby wipes and a little powder probably go a long way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm a baby wipe guy too. Do you uh, have you found a grand a brand of biodegradable baby wipes that uh, don't feel like sandpaper on your asshole? <laughs> Is that a thing, or does that not exist? I love this podcast. Thank you for having me on, guys. <laughs> no worries, um, bro. <laughs> so no, I, I no, I haven't. But I can tell you that uh, to, to share a little more, I, I, I did this by mistake once. And then I'm like, huh, maybe this is not such a bad thing. Um, I, I'm okay with the sandpaper thing, but, mm. uh, it's more of the biodegradable deal, but yeah, I had some wipes that actually had like, like, a like bleach maybe on them. Like they were like chlor chloride ox chlor. Oof. Anyways, they were some bleach wipes. Mm-hmm for like disinfecting, you know, countertops and stuff. Yeah. And that's all I had. I'm like, Oh, I got to use this. And so I threw them in a Ziploc and I took them out in the field. That sounds like a bad idea. Oh, I tell you what, the first morning you want to talk about lighting yourself on fire. Dude. Oh oh my, Oh my God. Like for half a day, I was walking around just burning. Um, and that's all I had. That's all I had for the rest of the trip. You know, uh, (laughs) <laughs> so last, but no, but I, but if you find it, but if you find some, like, let me know, like if you find a really good brand, yeah, yeah, I know. will. I don't even, I don't even know. L- L- you know, I, I, I grabbed some random ones at like a random camping store the other year and they were like, I, I didn't open the package till I got in the field. Eh? Like they were like in a nice small, like backpack size thing. I was like, fuck rad. Throw them right in the right, right in my, you know, kind of, uh, personal sanitary kind of kit right into a little um ultralight bag there and uh i get up the mountain and i go to wipe my ass and these things are like fuck they look like velcro bro they were not good (laughs) (laughs) they were rough but the the sanitation wipe thing that you're talking about so we we just had a uh in last october in the middle of elk season there we had our fourth and final baby and he arrived early so he was in that NICU and all over the NICU it's all about these sanitation things and they have all these like round like you know, white pullouts all over the place. Right. But on every single one of them, that's the sanitation ones. Like the ones that y- you say that, that you brought on that hunt, there's these yeah. big signs on them that say, not for on your body. They will cause irritation. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sorry, John. <laughs> no, but look how, you know, look how long we've been talking about backcountry hygiene. It's like, you could do a whole podcast on oh, that yeah. probably, you know, but it's not something that people think about until, until it's too late and then you're like damn you know now i'm sick or you know now i'm miserable or yeah. whatever the case may be you know you know what one kind of freaks me out a little bit i don't know Wacy, where you are on this camp either guys that don't bring toothbrushes mm. mm-hmm. where, where are you guys at well it's a to me it's a, it's a luxury item but i take a toothbrush and i just saw it down to like I literally cut the handle so it's like just fits in the palm of your hand and then i've heard of guys putting toothpaste on wax paper literally rolling it up and it weighs like an ounce so i don't think that's gonna make or break you so i don't know to me it's always been something i want to bring it's just the one thing i like where are you at on johnny I, i'm i'm back to i'm back to bringing it i'm um for years in the military i would i would just I don't know if it was lazy or just occupied with other things and I I didn't do it. And then after a while, you're like, bro, like you can't go for 20 years and not brush your teeth, you know, 150 days a year out in the field. So uh, not that I did it that long, but uh, no, I I definitely bring, what I try to do is uh, there's these little small travel, like travel toothbrushes. Sometimes you even get them on planes. Mm -hmm. Like I just bring like a, a tiny toothbrush and again like not even the ones that you buy in the store for like travel toothpaste i haven't tried the wax paper i should try that but like just a little bit and honestly sometimes when you're feeling lousy out there you know just brushing your teeth a little bit Mm -hmm. like almost makes you feel human again which which i think makes you focus and hunt better so at this point i'm like you know what yeah, it is a luxury. It's not like you need it. It's not like it's going to necessarily make or break your hunt. But I just, I just like at this point, I'm like, why not? Like for the, for that, you know, for the ounce and a half, it's going to take, mm-hmm. you know, so, why, why not bring it? So I'm on a camping trip with my wife and we're on like day two or three and I like roll over in bed 
uh, I mean, you know, I'm saying good morning or whatever. And I go to give her a kiss and she just goes, halitosis. And I was like, <laughs> do I stink that bad? She's like, dude, you fucking reek. Like, this is disgusting. So I started digging the, uh, the, down the, the toothbrush rabbit hole. And I found this thing. I don't know how to say the, the name of it. It's called a Aurel tube brush. And it's like, oh, uh, uh-huh. It's, it's on just, your finger. No, no, it's rad. It's like uh, the handle of it. You put the toothpaste in. It like pulls out. Oh, really? And, and then it's got like a cover. Yeah, I'm gonna text you this. You'll dig huh. it. Huh. You'll you'll dig Bad. this for sure. It weighs one I ounce. Got, I think you got a whole podcast here going on just hygiene, but like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think too. I I don't. I think they teach you guys this in the military. I'm not sure. Well, like one thing I've always done too, if a guy has got getting hot spots on his feet, I would always l- look at him. Like when he would say, oh, my foot's starting to hurt, I'd be like, take your boot off. Let's have a look. Like let's, let's get oh, some yeah. luke on it b- before it develops. And I don't think people understand like how to, like, how do you know when it's starting to get hot spots? Like that's the time. Don't keep pushing. Just stop. Look at your boot. Get your hunting partner to look at it too. See what he thinks. I guess if you if you blister out, you're fucked. Mm-hmm. I've been there. I've been there, man. It sucks. Yeah, that's uh, it, you know, that's interesting because we don't like. I just, I guess, I just take it for granted now. Um, you you have to take care of yourself out there, and yeah, if if you're starting to get hot spots, and and listen, you know, it's never convenient, right? It never happens at the right time, and you never want to deal with it. But all it takes is one time not dealing with it and shredding your feet like hamburger Yeah. to go, yeah, next time. Preventative is better than dealing with the actual issue after the fact, right? And um, yeah, that's why. So I just like to say, if you can control things and not kick your own ass, like you should definitely do that. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you have a hot spot and you know, all you have to do is stop and take 10 minutes, maybe at the next glassing knob, whatever, and deal with it. Like you're better off dealing with that than dealing with blisters in the next four days or like getting pushed out of the mountains or whatever. And so it's like, man, all those preventative things, it, it just, that, that's the, it's easy to be hard. It's hard to be smart deal. Right. It's like, yeah, everybody can like gut it out. But at a certain point, it's like, why are you doing this? Like, you're not now, now you're slow. Now you're not effective. Now you want to leave. Now you're, you know, you're not focused. Um, so it's like, you know, wh- wiping yourself down a little, little, little powder every three days, you know, brushing your teeth every night, making sure you're not putting shit stained fingers in your mouth. Like all those <laughs> things like are just super easy to prevent. But when you're not out there all the time, like, this isn't something that even crosses your mind, right? Because yeah. you're just focused on setting your tent up and trying to feed yourself. And, but, but, but these are the things that are actually going to keep you out there and really kind of make you quote a pro, mm-hmm. um, that, that, you know, you just, you just overlook and don't even think about it anymore. Like I hadn't honest to God, I hadn't thought about this backcountry hygiene thing to the level we're talking about for years Yeah, because it's just an assumption at this point. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think uh, I don't know if anything's assumption anymore. Snyder's that told me that people uh, message him on how to properly tie their hiking boots. What? So I think, yeah, he said. <laughs> so I think it's a thing. Like people just like people just don't know. I guess, and I don't know. I think it needs. To be I, I don't think I don't think people know, and, and you know, it's not their fault necessarily, but but I just don't think people know, and so that's why a podcast like this, quite frankly, is, is, is awesome because pe- people, you know, we, we all, Hey, we've been doing this a long time and it's okay for us to hear it again. So it, it's good to talk about those things. And, mm-hmm. and it's the things that people don't often talk about. So, you know, we always want to talk about, you know, the size of the Ram or, you know, the, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what weapon are we shooting or whatever, but it's like, man, these are the things that are actually going to keep you out in the field and effective. And they're just not often talked about as much as they may, they maybe should be. So I, I appreciate it guys. I'm actually taking notes just so you know, um, cause I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do, I might do a series of videos. I have to figure it out, but I think it's that important. I, think, I really do. Yeah. 
I'm ch- I'm changing the description on the uh, podcast website. It, we're this podcast is all about diarrhea, monkey butt, and brushing your teeth. <laughs> well, there you go. And 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 you know, if Snyder was on, if Snyder, if this was Snyder's podcast, or Snyder and I were talking, like you'd have to put an R rating on this. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I've been trying, I've been trying to keep it, I've been trying to keep it pretty, pretty cash. But me too. Um, but it, but dude, it's super important to the point where like. You know, just going back to the military deal, like, you know, there's there's, you know, probably, you know, I mean, depending on what unit, what you're doing, like there's there's day long classes on just field hygiene. Yeah, Um, it's it's that important to keep people out there. And, you know, I'll 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 use the term hunting effective. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they used to use the term combat effective, but just hunting effective. It's like it's so critical. Um, that it, that it just cannot be overstated and it doesn't, here's the thing. It doesn't actually take that much to do. You know, what's my, my one takeaway from this COVID thing over the last fucking God knows how long it's been that we've been dealing with this crap, um, is that people are gross. Like how, how come you need a reminder every 20 minutes to wash your hands? Like go to the bathroom, wash your hands, like eat a meal, maybe wash your hands first. Like people are just gross, man. And, uh, you know, maybe that translates to being even grosser when you're on the mountain. I, I mean, I've, I've seen, I've seen some bad stuff out there, you know, guys that just aren't taking care of themselves. And I mean, it can get pretty bad, mm-hmm. um, trench, trench foot, you know, frostbite, some things that, that actually can trend to be pretty, pretty difficult to, to manage out there. Yeah. Um, all because, you know, a dude doesn't want to change his socks every day. It's like, it seems so ele- elementary, right? It's like, Hey, change your socks every day, change your socks, dry your feet. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have to think about that very often when you're living back in civilization, no. you just kind of do it naturally. But if you don't consciously think about that, like you're probably going to have some issues mm-hmm. and, um, and those are going to have to be dealt with then. And, and it could be really bad for you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, I think, go ahead. Wait, I sorry. think you could, I think you could develop Marco. You could come up with a list of being like, you could have a backcountry hygiene kit. I bet you, you could do it for eight ounces or under like a little I, I thing. Of swamp, have, yeah. Little thing, of swamp ass powder, little thing, this little thing, a toothpaste and a toothbrush, something compact. And, um, you know, whatever else. So maybe it's a little bit of hand sanitizer to keep your fucking hands clean. And I think you could do it super light. I, I think we're going to have to do that and uh, get it out to people. I there, think it's worth doing. There you go. Okay. We're running the shot clock down here. You have a meeting to go to, but I have two things left on my, uh, in my notepad here that I have written down and I'll tell you what they are before we talk. So the first thing on there is sick of ambient. I want to talk about that. It looks super cool. cool. And, that, and then yeah. my last thing on here is knowledge from storms and how it's going, where it's going and, and how you're making out with it. So let's talk Sitka Ambient first. That looks super cool. And I think you, on the last podcast we did, you kind of talked about some of these new, <laughs> um, some of these new materials and insulations that are coming out that'll blow everybody's mind. And I assume this is one of them, eh? Yeah, this was probably the one I, I, uh, I was probably teasing it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'd, uh, I'd been wanting to talk about it for a while. I mean, literally, <laughs> so the sick ambient is basically an active insulation piece. Yeah. And what I mean by active insulation is it's something you put on to stay warm when you're moving in cold weather. Right. So it's like, I can't move in a base layer. If I put a puffy on, I'm going to be too hot. So I need something that's going to keep me warm, but also breathe and then dry real quick if it gets sweaty. So that's, that's what the ambient is. Um, the most basic form of active insulation is say heavyweight fleece. Mm-hmm. Super cool. Um, but doesn't layer real well. And if it, you know, if it starts to like have a light snow or light, light precipitation, like we had on, on the, our spring bear hunt, then you have to stop and put something over top of it or it's going to get wet. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so sick has had something called the Kelvin active jacket and hoodie for quite a few years. Yeah. Um, that was a technology that I actually had learned about when I was in the military and we actually helped, uh, that company bring that insulation to, to the commercial market. But 
to me, I'd always had a few issues and, and one of which was oftentimes you had to use a liner. So a third layer of material inside the jacket or the hoodie. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they eventually came out with something you didn't have to do that. But we were already on to working with Primaloft to develop like this new active insulation. And so that's what the ambient is, mm-hmm. is this new Primaloft insulation. And when you look at it on the inside of the jacket, like the, the inner liner is the insulation. It so looks it's like, like this soft. Yeah, it's like this soft furry thing. And it actually, you know, Primaloft will tell you it, it mimics animal fur. And in some regard, it does. So you can't tell by looking at it with the naked eye, but all the fibers are not the same length, mm-hmm. nor are all the fibers the same uh, diameter. So there's different diameters and different lengths, just kind of like animal fur. So it allows you to help trap some moisture. It allows you to help move some moisture. It allows you to have a little less uh, insulation overall than you, than you normally would. So it's a little lighter, which means it dries quicker. And so all this is happening at a, at a pretty kind of minute level, but it adds up to make this Primaloft insulation more efficient than the insulation we were using previously in the Kelvin Active. And so you take this insulation and now we put a really lightweight, durable face on it. So the outer fabric Mm -hmm. And so what that does is gives you the best of both worlds. So now I've got this active insulation like a heavyweight fleece, but really performance oriented. And now that I put the face on top of it, it makes it more durable. It blocks a little wind. But now, dude, if you're on a stock or you're hiking up a hill, trying to get to your glass and knob before sunrise, and it starts to snow a little bit or rain a little bit, it doesn't matter because it's going to shed this water because of the face on it. And then when you get up there, if you put a puffy over top, it's going to dry super quick. It's mm-hmm. going to layer really nice. So it's not going to limit you from, you know, shouldering a, uh, a rifle or, or drawing a bow. I, I think every fucking hunter should at least look at the ambient. And I'm not saying that because, uh, you know, I help make it and, and I'm mm-hmm. selling it. I, I like, I truly believe that. And, the big game hunters, you know, we've had access to this, these items. Like I said, this Kelvin Active we had in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have. One. But now, but now we're going to have uh, the option for the whitetail hunter and the waterfowl hunter to also be able to use this. So the Ambient Series has a hundred gram hoodie. So that's a hundred grams of insulation. So that's the one that you and I and and Wacy would run around in on our on our backcountry hunts. Mm-hmm. And then there's a 150 gram version that we've never had before. And that's going to be awesome for like that waterfowl hunter in those later seasons when he's setting a field of decoys up or that whitetail hunter when he's walking to his blind or tree stand and it's super cold, but he can't wear all his insulated shit or he's going to overheat, mm-hmm. right? That's where this 150 gram ambient jacket's going to come in. And so I'm looking at a picture right now. I posted it on my story a couple of days ago, but um, two years ago, I had my Iowa whitetail tag. I drew my Iowa whitetail archery tag, mm-hmm. and I actually killed that buck wearing this, I think it was a second proto, pretty sure it was a second proto, yeah, um, of the ambient hoodie. Um, so it's quiet, it's stretchy, it's breathable, um, and so, you know, I've been testing it a long time, but I couldn't tell anybody about it. And so mm-hmm. now that it's out and, you know, spoiler alert, uh, for those waterfowl and whitetail hunters, like those patterns are coming here the end of August, I think. Nice. Um, there's going to be some more colors for women. Um, so I'm really jacked on it, dude. And the, the launch so far, it's been out in the market for three weeks. Like the, the response has been pretty positive, but people's people still need to like learn about this and understand what it is and why they need it and how it's going to make them more efficient. And they're not going to have to stop and put something on or take something off. And so, you know, if you're moving in on a stock and you're archery hunting and, you know, it's a little bit like we were on this bear hunt, it was like, it would snow a little bit, then it'd rain a little bit, then snow a little bit and it'd rain a little bit. It's like, if you have rain gear on, you're not going to be able to slip in close. Yeah. I just put this thing on, man. It gives me the insulation I need. It's going to breathe enough. 
it's going to shed a little precipitation, but it's going to be quiet for me to get in there and kill that animal. Um, it, it's just what I've been, it's just what I've been hunting in for the last three years now. That's awesome. Um, I can just finally talk about it. So I, I appreciate you letting me kind of, you know, give you the pitch about mm-hmm. what it is and, and why it's so cool. Well, man, I, I, I've been a big believer in the Kelvin active. You introduced that into my system. It, it, it um, being a, uh, a sweaty guy, it's been a game changer for me because I have forever been the guy that will hike a ridge, drop my pack and throw insulation on to dry out. That's been me. Right. And, uh-huh. w- and with the Kelvin active, it's been like, I can kind of leave it on cause it vents off for me. And then when I get to the top, I can kind of just start glassing or whatever. Um, and like, even on my February goat hunt last year, like when we were off sleds and we were just ripping up that mountain, you need a little bit of insulation on, but you also don't want to get wet. Um, and the way that the way the Kelvin act vented off for me was fabulous. So this ambient hoodie, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to trying. And I think like, it's going to be great for, especially like, um, Southern Alberta mule deer where you have to be quiet, but it's cold as hell. And you're also putting on a lot of miles on foot, you know, hiking these little coolies and stuff like that, or hoodoos. Um, I'm excited for it, man. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Yeah. And and that Alberta thing is a, is a perfect example because I was up there a couple of years ago with Snyder and it was just so brutally cold. And Mm -hmm. I I can't, I I don't know if I had a proto of this yet or not, but I I might've had the Calvin active, but yeah, because you need to be quiet, but you also need to stay warm, uh, and be able to draw your bow. Like that's where I would put like a piece of wind stopper, like a wind stopper vest or a wind stopper jacket, like our mountain jacket on, Mm -hmm. and then put this ambient or Kelvin over top. Yep. And then I would be quiet, but that wind stopper would block the wind, keep me warm. Um, and so that system in reverse works really well for that archery guy or gal, right. Trying to get in really close. (laughs) Um, so yeah, there's just, it, it's going to change the way it's going to change the way people dress for hunting, but I think it's going to also change the way people hunt. I think it's going to make them more efficient and, and that's why I'm so excited about it. You know, it's like go out and set, you know, your hundred decoys or whatever on a cool frosty morning before the sun comes up, blow off the heat, stay warm. But as soon as you're done and getting ready to climb into the pit blind or, or the layout blind or whatever it is. Um, just put your insulation right over top and mm-hmm. it goes from an, uh, an outerwear piece to a mid layer piece. And it's going to layer just really nice and not bind up on you mm-hmm. like that. That's, that's what it, this is. This whole thing's all about. That's wicked, man. I I'm looking forward to it. And so to segue here a little bit, um, my layering and clothing system has been completely changed since knowledge from storm started because instead of texting you and harassing you for for help (laughs) now (laughs) and not everybody has that luxury i know but uh now i go and i watch your videos and like i mean a lot of those videos like your your eight eight piece layering system video and i've talked about that with you on here before um I go back and I watch it pretty much every time I pack to make sure I'm not screwing it up. You know what I mean? Um, uh, So yeah, knowledge from storms. I mean, like I say, it's been a complete game changer for me and um, for a lot of guys, some of it uh, might be information that's already in our brain, but it's really nice to go over thing and and hear, hear your take on something. And um, it's very rare. You get through one of those videos without some takeaway, um, that changes something that you're doing or, or prompts you to do something new. So, yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's been two years now, I think since I've done that and yeah, you know, I, I, I actually didn't know if one, I would like it two if anybody else would like it and, and three, if I was going to continue it. So I like to say, I reserve the right to stop at any time. <laughs> um, Screw and that kind of going home. Yeah, exactly. Screw you guys. I'm going home. And that, that gives me my, like my out. So if I just, if you never hear from me again on social media, that's what happened. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just quitting cold Turkey, but no, I've liked it, man. So I'm trying to up my game and, um, I've, uh, you know, I bought, I bought the cameras and the lighting and the mics and I just posted something 
uh, I think last week, but that was the first time I'd, I'd actually used the, the better equipment. So it sounds better. It looks better. You know, I posted it to YouTube, so I'm going to keep posting more stuff to YouTube. I'm going to try to up my game as far as that. And then I, uh, I partnered with this, uh, it's called outdoor class and, um, uh, outdoor class is kind of like master class for the outdoors. Oh, and so cool. it's, uh, it's a new platform. It just started and I've got, you know, I, I've signed on with those guys to right now, my, my initial kind of, um, my initial offering is going to be, I'm going to build three courses with those guys. So three complete courses I'm going to build out with outdoor class. And then, you know, I hope I've got nine written. I probably have more like 18 total. Um, but we'll see where it goes, but I'm hoping to build these courses out at a super high level. And then, you know, people can go and watch and, and learn and, and take notes, but it'll be, you know, done really well. Um, so it won't just, you know, you won't just have to go to my IG or, or YouTube. You can go to outdoor class and, and not just have access to my, you know, my, uh, courses, but, but everybody else's who's eventually going to be involved. Um, you know, Remy Warren, Corey Jacobson, yeah, there Newberg, you go. yeah, Newberg, like there's gonna be so many and there's, they're, they're signing on more people as we go. Um, and so I'm hoping to eventually build out, you know, it, it, in a perfect world, I was going to write a book and then I realized nobody reads books anymore. And like, if I could do my entire book, start to finish on the, on, on video courses instead, like mm -hmm. that would be, that would be my, my goal. Um, everything from planning to survival and everything in between, um, would be, kind of where I'd like to see this outdoor class thing go for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, so that's, that's been really new. I think that just got announced maybe a month ago and, you know, my courses are not on there yet, but, but they will be. Um, and I'll certainly, you know, talk about it when they are, but, uh, yeah, man. So, I, you know, you talked about earlier about burning out and just not being like, you know, how do you stay motivated? Mm -hmm. I, for whatever reason, like I really enjoy teaching people and helping people like be better in the outdoors. And I don't care if you're climbing, skiing, hunting, you know, backpacking, whatever bird watching. Like mm -hmm. I think Sweetie. that I got, I got something to help. I got something to help you do better out there. And so I, that's what motivates me, dude. I, I really enjoy that. And, um, and so I'm more fired up now about, kind of this knowledge from storms deal than I was even two years ago when I started. Wicked. I love it. That's awesome, man. I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad you're doing it too. I remember when we first started talking and you're like, well, you know, I'm doing this thing and social media, blah, yada, yada, yada. And now you're just yeah. like, I, I didn't am. know if I wanted to do it. Yeah. Well, I don't blame you, man. It's it, I'm, I'm stoked. I'm stoked you're doing it. And like, I read every single one of those things, man. They're awesome. It's just the best. Um, well, I, I appreciate that. And listen, I'm, it's not like I'm a, a huge fan of social media, but that's the world we live in. And that's how you can communicate to people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think it's a combination of things. Like I love, I love podcasts. Like I love what you guys are doing on the podcast and, you know, you do a little IG and do a little YouTube and like, it just gives people so many different avenues to go and, uh, and check things out and learn and get better. And, uh, you know, I think that's a worthy goal. You know, I think at the end of the day, if you can help people go out there and do whatever they want to do and be safe and, and have fun and be successful, however they define that, like, that's pretty cool. And, uh, it's been a good thing for me to balance, you know, the other job I have at Sitka, which, you know, is, is just, it's a different deal. It's like, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to build world-class product as best I can. And, you know, you got to work in a, a, a more in a business type environment. And then I can come home and just focus on being a, a kind of a, an instructor, which I really, which I really enjoy. So it's been a good balance for me to kind of do the, do the two things in, uh, kind of in, in conjunction with each other. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. I love it, man. I'm glad. So I, I always appreciate you guys having me on. I'm sorry. It, it took so long. Um, clearly you have to text me several times, but I love coming on. So don't ever hesitate to ask. Yeah, man. It's, it's always a pleasure chatting with you, John. And, uh, it's nice. Uh, it's always nice catching up and, 
all that kind of stuff, man. So, yeah, I, I would say the next time we talk, mm-hmm. uh, let's uh, we're going to have some hunting stories to tell, I think. So, yeah, yeah good luck on your guys mountain goat hunt. Like I do miss doing those. Um, I'll have probably done at least an antelope hunt, if not, hopefully kill the bull by then. Um, so, yeah, let's, uh, you know, let's circle up when we got when we got some fun stories to tell. Absolutely, and, uh, man. Clear, there'll, there'll be at least one monkey butt story. I, guess, <laughs> I hope time. not, man. I got next it. time we talk. <laughs> I'm just I'm on Amazon ordering freaking powders and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know what would be really good if if that powder actually turned out to be some kind of like joke powder. When you put it on your ass, it just burns like a bastard. And then I could be <laughs> I could be on top of some mountain at eight thousand feet feet going John. Just, oh, just that's bad. funny. That would rule. That'd be yeah. The best. Well, I guess you're. I guess you're gonna have to order it and find out. I did. I did. So, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> right on, brother. Okay, I'll hit end on this thing. Wacey, you're good. All good. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah, man. Like I said, thanks. Thanks for having me on, guys. I I always enjoy it. Uh, it's been a good good use of my good use of my morning. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review. You can follow us on Instagram at Wilderness Locals. If you want to support the podcast, please check out the gear, articles, and whatever else we're up to on the website at www.wildernesslocals.net.